all about them. Mm-hmm. And it's immense. And, and before I start the lecture, and I would like to introduce Mr. Ramkumar from Elsevier, who will just say a few words about the 24 edition and I'm the publisher and what resources are available to students, which is quite <laughs> exciting. So I'll pass around to over and then we'll get started with the presentation. Thank you. So the name is and we all know about the name is and we have been using from uh, all the publication, all the publication, all the publication, I would really like to thank Ranatan for your support, continuous support as a faculty, as a student for this particular edition. This has traveled a long way of 1952 to 2022. So it's already three years long journey. It's all possible because of all your support. We really appreciate and the thanks for that particular one. So when you start like the first edition when the Davidson started, the 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 all come from this particular problem. Now, as a five year student, you will be seeing other five year titles as well, starting from across gynecology, anti medicine, Hutchinson, and anti oxygen, and you have some of your viewers as well as the group of other people, and so on. So, all come from this particular problem. Thanks for all your support. So, one important point. Uh, we would like to know us from the FTP and the leaders and not by genuine books, by version it, because this really helps us to kind of, uh, uh, helps in kind of producing much more relevant and to deal with the future as well. And there is also a reason to buy a version of book, because now all the test books which come to the software comes with an e-access, uh, e-books are available which can use it really like every time. And this particular ebook which comes with uh, searchable content, you can actually highlight those content, and you can also use the hundred features which is available in the version. I will use the letters are really small, right? The right side which you can see, but I use the version and you can do a help or something by using this particular one. The reason why you know all this information comes because we also understand students who are most of the using different various platforms, which make it much easier to navigate through the other ones. And you don't need to pay additional cost when you have a paper book in prior edition and print copy. This particular access comes completely free. The other, uh, you know, the other thing is when you go to the edition of the CD, you know about this particular title and what we are really done this particular edition. This is the CD, we have got more than possible diagrams available in the version. We have got a problem based, you know, cases uh, which are there to so kind of solve it. And you have a point where you know, practice point company you have to be chapter. And you also have a competency chapter, which is going uh, because you know the CBA curriculum is going to be like a media. And this particular book is you know, aligned to the CBA curriculum. Uh, just you know, it is not aligned with the word, which you have also practically covered all the competencies in every competency number and the description of the competency in the chapter number, the page number, on the only competency in the home medicine competency. Just, I think, I'm not 
God wants to say, look, and if you aim for the cause, uh, you aim for the cause, okay? So here we go. It's um, Slido.com. <laughs> I don't know if you can scan that, I think it's far away, but the, the code number is hash 1108522. Okay. And um, so the question, the test question, which is a topical one, is which team is most likely to win the cricket? I know this is a sore point for some people in the audience, but uh, who do you think is going to win the cricket? You can either vote for one of two sides. And if you vote, it should register on this. I hope. So I'm in the, in the top right, I've been allocated in North of India, Richard Hobson in uh, the bottom right here is kind of south uh, west, and uh, Mark Strang in south east, and Ian Peng in uh, east. So um, like, we've got a slide already, and we hope to do some interaction during the week. Now, <laughs> what I'm going to do is uh, hang the presentation around four clinical cases. So I will um, tell you about the clinical cases. And I'll show some investigations and I'll ask you what you think the diagnosis is. And then we'll, we'll, we'll reveal the diagnosis and we'll talk about all the underlying diseases. So, case one is a 68 year old woman who presented with joint pain and septics affecting the hands, wrists, and knees. Um, the onset was over several days, with no trigger factor, but it was obvious. Most of the morning, and knees well after an hour or so. On past medical history, she had ischemic heart disease and hypertension. She was on Simvastatin for the Simvastatin with Kiflodamol, and she was smoking. She smoked 15 cigarettes a day, drank 10 units of alcohol, which is moderate, and body mass index was 32, so she was slightly overweight. And what I'm going to do is um, show you the investigations uh, that came up in this lady, and um, there are some abnormalities. The hall is too big for you to shout out, I think, because I won't be able to hear you. But I'll just highlight the abnormalities uh, that we see in this lady. So she was anemic, abnormal clonic normalcy, anemia. Her platelets um, were high, 650 times 10 to the 9th. Her ESR was high. Her vitamin D level was slightly low. This is quite common in women of this age. Um, her alkaline phosphorus was high. The C reactive protein was very high, um, but the immunology was negative. So she was negative for anti-cyclic citronic antibodies, weakly positive for the enemy. And I'll show you her hands in the next slide. So this is what her hands look like. And in a moment, I'll let you look at her hands. I'm going to try and go um, to Slido once again. Push me up. Yeah, here we go. Um, so I'm going to stop that and I'm going to um, go on to the next one. So there was the lady, high ESR, high CRP, um, slightly anemic, and um, she had painful hands and wrists. And when this comes up eventually, you'll be given an option. Diagnoses and what was the most likely cause of the symptoms? Well, I think many of you have actually voted. And um, so it was a rheumatoid arthritis, osteoarthritis, viral arthritis, lupus, 
or sorry, after that practice. And in fact, I see the audience sometimes it goes in entirely uh, for uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, we'll come back to the presentation. And you're absolutely right. A very uh, keyed up bunch of students. You all got absolutely right. Very impressed. It's rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, the picture shows some of the features in the hands. You see swollen wrists, swollen the MCP joints, that's the neck, up and down the So of the IPs in the hands are held in flexion. That's what you usually see with rheumatoid in patients with active arthritis. Now, rheumatoid is the second most common cause of inflammatory arthritis. Uh, about 1% of the population, it varies between the different countries, but 1% are very large. It's a symmetrical arthritis, in other words, affecting both sides equally. Usually, hands and feet, but if any joint can be affected, there's morning stiffness and what's called inactivity gelling. That refers to a situation where the patient sits down and then when you go up again, the joints move slightly again. The soft tissue swelling and tenderness of the affected joints and indicating sign of arthritis. About 70% are positive for that, that's called seropositivary. About 30% are negative. And this lady was negative for ACMA, so she was at a zero negative. And we used uh, the NAS 28 score to assess the disease activity. So this is a snapshot from Davidson 24 we uh, just describing the NAS 28. And what you do is you, you feel the joints, you count the number of swollen joints and tender joints, as shown in the mannequin, the red highlighted joints. You measure the ESR or CRP. You ask the patient how the active arthritis is, how 100, so 90 would be very high, 10 would be not very active, and you enter into a calculator and it will calculate the score. And the higher the value, uh, the more active. And uh, in, for example, prime point one, a lot of that's very high activity, definitely necessitating treatment, but less than 2.6 is in remission. And um, on pathogenesis, like many disorders, there's both a genetic and environmental component. Um, for our way, the genetic predisposition is due to variations in HLA D4, although there's hundreds of genetic variants that also predispose. The HLA D4 is the most important. Environmental triggers, one that's definitely broken is smoking, but there's also thoughts that maybe uh, means there might be an infection which triggers the disease, there might be stress. What that does is uh, initiate an immune response and expose proteins. You get infiltration or activation, sorry, of T cells, B cells, macrophages, and osteoclasts. A lot of pro inflammatory cytokines are released along the prostate, the nitroxide, metalloproteinases, and that causes joint inflammation and disruption. Occasionally, you can get extra articular features. Rheumatoid one would be lung fibrosis, nodules. Pericarditis, or we're seeing those less frequently nowadays, probably because of earlier treatment. Now, I'm sure the other snapshot from David says I like to call this pathogenesis of RA at plants. So you get a host protein, it's modified, maybe by smoking or whatever, uh, it is detected as abnormal by antigen presenting cells, like dendritic cells, uh, that uh, presents the peptide to T cells. The T cells are activated, you have a whole train of events. Uh, leads uh, to uh, the clinical condition of the roadway. Now, um, back to the audience participation, I want to consider what was the most likely environmental trigger. Was it overweight, smoking, sleep parties, alcohol, or standing treatment? Let's go back to slide O. Okay, I'll present this. What was the most likely environmental trigger in this patient? Overweight. Um, Alcohol and no, it was overweight and smoking. Maybe it was a steaming heart disease, I heard it wrong for a minute. Yeah, overweight, smoking, steaming heart disease, alcohol, and sand treatment. What do you think is the most likely environment to trigger in this case that I've just described? She was slightly overweight, she was a smoker, she had a steaming heart disease, she had more alcohol, she was in a sand. So, any ideas? Can you vote? Right. Uh, 
and in this case, in this particular case, like I actually saw the thing coming up. It's actually smoking was the most important trigger in this patient. Um, uh, and um, smoking is a very strong risk factor for rheumatoid, also inflammatory bowel disease. So it's something to keep in mind when you see patients that you do smoke. Now, on management of rheumatoid, this is uh, well, through the modern management. Uh, first thing is we nowadays give a short course of steroids. Prednisolone 30 mix daily, then gradually reducing to 25, 20, 15, 10, I can stop. Um, we don't use long term steroids in the toilet very much at all now. And then we start giving those stress at the same time with methotrexate, and then you might escalate the dose from 15 up to 25 if necessary. You would refer to physio, you would refer to occupational therapy, and it has to stop smoking. Now, <laughs> Many patients, about one third in the rheumatoid, will respond well to a short course of steroids and benefits, and well, you won't need to do anything else. If the response is inadequate, though, well, what we have to do is add another two DMARs, uh, some of the salicy, and hydroxychloroquine, that's what triples therapy, okay? And that can really uh, get control of the disease in many cases. Uh, there's another uh, DMAR we use with Lunamide, I don't want to go into that in great detail, that's something to use. Now, if the response is still inadequate to triple therapy, then we need to progress to uh, more powerful drugs, either biologics or targeted synthetic DMARs. And we have a wide choice now. We have T TNM, perhaps 6 inhibitors. We have Aratacet, which inhibits T cell activation. We have Tuxumab, which inhibits B cells, and JAK inhibitors. And on the next slide, I've illustrated where these molecules work in the pathways of TNF. Is made by macrophages and inhibitors uh, work here. Tosolizumab and sarilumab work in IL-6, so that's up to IL-2. Paratacet uh, uh, works at T cell activation by the clinic cells down here, and the tuxumab works in B cells. But just to highlight jack inhibitors, these uh, are relatively new class of drugs. They are very, very effective actually when used across a range of inflammatory diseases. And they work in signaling molecules called JACs. Standing with gyrosacrate kinase, so the kinase inhibitors, downstream of cytokine receptors. So, one of these drugs will have a interferon signaling, PAP2 signaling, and also IL 6 signaling. So, they're probably very useful across the range of inflammatory uh, diseases today. Okay, and um, so uh, here we have it rheumatoid, and also inflammatory and arthritis. Average age, context 50 to 60 overall, this lady is a bit older than that. But she was a uh, female, and females are most commonly affected. Both genetic and environmental components, primarily parts and joints, other tissue can be affected. And treatment is based on administrating new suppressors. And actually, now we have a very wide range of treatment options available. And we can control the disease really in the vast majority of patients, which certainly was the case uh, when I was at your stage in medical school or as a bone structure. Okay, so that's rheumatoid. Um, I'm going to go on to um, a second case, a di totally different, a 32-year-old man with pain in his lower limbs of about six months duration. It was worse than weight bearing. He had bone pain since childhood and was diagnosed with having crickets. And in fact, he underwent orthopedic surgery as a child. He was all at the time of the federal tramadol, paracetamol, and alpha-calcidol. And alpha-calcidol is an active vitamin D metabolite, okay? He's a non smoker, not drink, short stature, which is relevant, and his body mass index was normal. And uh, I'll show the investigations again, and I'll just highlight the abnormalities. And the two major abnormalities were his phosphate was low, and his alkaline phosphatase was high. Okay. He would go in pneumatology, nothing very much. On x ray, I was lower limbs, and I'd just like to show you that. So on the left, you've got the x-ray of the tibia, on the right, the x-ray of the femur, and I'd like you just to look at that for a moment, okay? And I'd like you to consider um, what the likely diagnosis was. I'm going to give this slide a one more go, and if it doesn't work, I'm going to stop it, okay? What was the right cause of this man's symptoms? Let's give it a try. Okay. 
Maybe they can try it and see if the criticisms are false or if they're not false. Okay. Awesome. We went to a new condition also in Malaysia. It's a high profile terrorism. Uh, was a high profile team in Greg Hens. Oh, geez, that's the wrong one. Right, okay, I'm going to have to try it out. It was it was high profile team in Greg It was high profile team in Greg Okay, so the features of uh, X and H are the we have shown here. Um, Stress factors, which you can see, and we're getting marked with one of these on the pain, and I'm saying the wrong things, and that's why these uh, are sort of stature. And right across the three critics, um, it's a right to tear, given to rear, uh, inherited disorders of positive metabolism. There are three main subtypes. There is X linked, right across the three critics, called XLH, and that's due to mutations in the X gene. It's not just only dominant. Which is the FJ23 gene, and the autism process of the EMP1 gene. And they all in common uh, are characterized by neoplastic wasting using increased circulating FJ23. So FJ23 is the key to these disorders. It was only about 10 or 15 years ago this, this was discovered. It's a hormone coming from bone cells called osteocytes. Now, the presentation is usually with childhood crickets and resistant to standard treatment. And you have a lot of problems with it, like bone deformity, growth retardation, fractures, endosopathy, which is like a no way type disorder, and dental problems. Okay, so here's the path of physiology, and I want you to uh, uh, think closely at this. So, in effect, in DMV1 mutations, what happens then is these gene mutations, the genes normally suppress FJ23, but the mutations don't permit that. So, there's too much FJ23 produced. That acts in the kidney to increase velocity excretion and suppress 125 d uh, 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 synthesis, and that causes weakness. The ADHR, the other type, here the mutation is actually in the FJ23 itself. So, X and the MP1 are normal, there's a normal amount of FJ23 release. But the problem is, FJ23 is mutated at a point, meaning it can be cleaved by proteins in the circulation. And it's resistant to proteolysis, it increases, and the same train of events ensues with high velocity distribution and low 125 and Okay, so that's uh, high velocity crickets. How do we manage this condition? Well, the traditional management uh, is as shown here is phosphate supplements. The idea is you try and replace by mouth uh, the phosphate that's coming out of the kidney for active vitamin D metabolites. So we can have the vitamin D metabolites. And the idea is that it compensates for the defect in the 125 gene synthesis and it increases also absorption. Now, the downside to this treatment is that adherence is very challenging, especially with falsely. It's difficult to get correct metabolic abnormality, even with the best efforts. And there's a risk, actually, of hypercalcemia, nephrocalcinosis, and kidney damage. Now, there has been a new uh, development in treatment called hypercalcemia crickets. And it's with this medicine called um, Urosumab, Urosumab, okay? And it is an antibody to FJ23, okay? It's a neutralizing antibody. And the results of this medicine are absolutely uh, outstanding and really astonishing. I'm showing the data from a trial by uh, Eric Kimmel, which uh, published in the Lancet. And what you looked at is you compared conventional therapy, that's the red uh, bars, with Urosumab, that's blue. On crickets, low quality, and they all eat the writing and healing of crickets. And what they found was the Rosmap was better in conventional therapy at healing crickets, at both 40 weeks and 64 weeks, better in conventional therapy at preventing low quality, and better in the clinic biochemical control. So it really is a fantastic development in childhood crickets. It also uh, is effective in adults. This is data from a trial that we took part in in adults with XLH. And there were two groups. One was Burosima, that's the blue line. One was placebo, that's the black. And in the first 24 weeks, there was 43% healing with Burosima, only 7% with placebo. And it got even better with Burosima, up to 63%. At this point, all of the placebo patients were transferred to Burosima, Burosima in the practice started to heal. So, in fact, the young man uh, that I presented was in this trial, and the medicine completely changed his life. He was managed to keep off uh, 
you know, all paid killers might actually return pretty much to normal. So it is a huge advance uh, uh, in the treatment of this disorder. So, microcosmic clinics, just to summarize, rear inherited disorders caused by neonatal loss of ADHD, most commonly, the, the mediator is FJ23, most common form is FJ23. There's a lot of morbidity with this disorder in the form of deformity, fractures, myopathy, growth, retardation. But in, as soon as we move on with the availability of this glossomatic treatment, I think we'll see those much less. And because it really truly has revolutionized management. Okay, now we have the next case. It's a young man with low back pain and hip pain. And here's the presentation 22 year old man, low back pain uh, in the morning. It also was when he was working as a tire fitter, which is relevant to the presentation. Over the past two months, he developed pain in the left groin on walking. So that's a new symptom, more recent. There was no history of trauma, he was on pain killers, nothing very much on demographics. Um, Lowish body mass in theirs. Just to show some investigations, I, I'll, I'll let you have a look at these. I won't ask for suggestions, uh, just because of the size of it. the hall. But the two main abnormalities on the investigations were the fact that his ESR was high and his C reactive protein was high. So when you see a raised ESR, raised C reactive protein, you're thinking inflammation or infection. And that's the two things. And I'm going to show you the x ray as well. Okay, that's the x ray as well. I'd like you to look at that. Um, it's quite tricky on this. And uh, we'll, we'll come to the, uh, the MCQ. Um, I'm also with the uh, slide, so I'm going to look for a show of hands from the audience. So there you go, that's the history, low back pain and stiffness, left, right, hip pain. What's, you put your hands up, what's, who thinks you've got a slip disc as a result of his symptoms? No hands up. Anyone for mechanical back pain? Mechanical back pain, very common. Anyone for axial spondylar arthritis? Axial spondylar arthritis. You, Principal thinks that, and I would go with him. Axel Swan Arthritis. Pelvic fracture? Pelvic fracture, anyone? Vertebral osteomyelitis. No. The diagnosis actually is both axial Swan Arthritis and pelvic fracture. And I'll highlight the abnormalities. And in the SI joints, the sclerosis and irregularity of the SI joints, I'm just highlighting uh, the right hand one, but both are affected and the infusion of the SI joints in the uh, lower side. He also, though, had a pelvic fracture. What happened is his femoral neck had gone right through uh, the acetabular socket, and he, he developed this pelvic fracture. It turned out to be a very severe osteoporosis. His low density of these was minus 4.5, and, and that is probably why he got uh, the fracture. Now, axial swaddle arthritis affects about 1.5% of the population. Okay. Males greater than females. The typical presentation is low back pain and stiffness. Okay, but you can get large joint involvement with sinusitis, and you can get what's called pentasitis. So pentasitis is inflammation where the tendons go into the joints or the bone, and a common site is, for example, Achilles tendonitis. Okay, and um, osteoporosis importantly is a very important complication, and you can get vertical fractures. Now, um, the, the, it's kind of right clinical spectrum. If you have this syndrome and x ray changes in the, in the uh, pelvis, as this man had, it is called ankylosing spondylitis. If you have the symptom complex, there's no x ray changes, but there are MRI changes, and that's called axial spondylarthropathy. So it's a less advanced stage, let's say, of the disorder. And if you complicate reactive arthritis, and complicate inflammatory bowel disease associated with arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. So it can occur in all of those uh, conditions, which collectively are called zero negative spinal arthropathies. Now, the x ray of the pelvis and SI joints can give you the diagnosis. The MRI is more sensitive than every disease. So I'll just make a point with the ESR. And in this one, the ESR and CRP were raised, but that can be normal. So if you ever see a patient with low back pain and sickness with a normal ESR and CRP, it doesn't exclude uh, an axe block, and it may well be present. And I think what bias dye is used to assess disease activity. So this is bias dye. 
starting your graph, trying to lose some more varieties, the exact the index. And what you do is you ask the patient about the G, neck, back, or neck pain, swelling of other joints, tender of areas, overall pain in the morning sickness. You ask me to a you put it into the calculator, and the higher the score, the more active. And as I recall, this patient, I've just been saying, the score was 6.73, very high activity. Now, moving on uh, to the pathogenesis, um, uh, like, like rheumatoid, there's a genetic predisposition. Here, the major genetic determinant is B27, HLA B27. So, about 90% of people are positive for HLA B27. Uh, but there are multiple other gene variants that we disclose. The environmental trigger, the leading theory, is that it's changes to the intensity of the microbiome that trigger this, causing activation of the immune cells and the blood cell glucosa, including TH17 cells. Which, uh, uh, which leads to the option of IL-17, IL-23, IL-22, and those cytokines cause inflammation in the joints, the endesis and synomium, and eventually the joints may completely fused. Now, again, a snapshot from the papers in 24 e this is a pack of glands, how things happen, you've got the microbial, uh, things going on in the gut, activation of the neutrophic cells. IL-23, this seems to be quite a little cytokine, they need to increase IL-17, um, which needs to increase DNF. And as I'll show shortly, all of these uh, uh, molecules are targets for treatment. Now, with regard to the management, still, the first line of management of Axpa is non-steroidal antibiotics, or NSAIDs, and a proxen, typically 500 mixed DID, or a celecoxib, 200 mixed DID. We also refer the patient to the physio to do back exercises to try and promote good health care. If the response is inadequate to NSAIDs um, and advanced times we read before, then we can move on to um, more targeted therapy. That would be anti GNF, adalimumab, paracet, there's a whole lot of other anti GNF drugs, IL 17. Sedupinumab is the one we most commonly use, or JAK inhibitors, I just told you already. In the rheumatoid uh, case are like these. So all of these are effective therapies if NSAIDs are going to work. So uh, just a bit of uh, evidence uh, backing up the use of IL-17 inhibitors. So the right panel is the ASAS body. That's a plot with a percentage of patients of 40% of the group with the disease score. And on the right is ASAP 50. So on the right, this is uh, IL-17 blockers. And as you can see, much better than placebo. The placebo prime is down here, and uh, infliximab, a TNF inhibitor, much better than placebo. So that's the evidence base upon which we are using those drugs. And it was similar for uh, Jack inhibitors too. So, in summary, axial spondylo is a group of inflammatory diseases predominantly targeted to SI drugs in the spine. HLA is important, microbiome may be involved. It's a wide clinical spectrum with spine involvement, but also maybe peripheral joint involvement. And you can also get a few extra peripheral features. Notably, mediatus is a very uh, uh, important complication. So the first line treatment is still with NSAIDs, a variety of biologics that target the DMARDs for resistant disease. So that next one. Okay, we were on now to our last course for today. We had a patient for today, and it's a 75 year old man with headache. Okay, so here's the history. Three week history of headache in the temple and opposite the regions. He's got color, he's had jaw pain on chewing, and he's had blurring of vision. His past medical history includes type 2 diabetes, osteoarthritis, previous MI, he's on paracetamol, he's on metformin for the diabetes, and he's on clopidogrel. He's not smoker, very small amount of alcohol, his body mass index just to the upper limit normal. I will go through, as with the other cases, the investigations. And I'll just highlight once again the abnormalities. So he was very mildly anemic, not very much, he was slightly anemic. His platelets were very slightly high. And the two strikeout things are his ESR is really high, it's 80, and his C reactive protein is also quite high. And the question is, what do we think is the cause of this man's symptoms? Uh, could it be osteoarthritis of the temporal mandatory joints? Anyone, anyone for osteoarthritis? No. Anyone for a brain tumor? Could this be an intracerebral space out behind lesion one? Someone at the back of that? Could it be a subarachnoid hemorrhage? 
Anyone from a Samurai country? Anyone from a giant cell arthritis? See if you have hands for giant cell arthritis like you. Anyone from me grade? One from me grade? Okay. Correct right answer is giant cell arthritis. Thank you to members of the audience that got that right. Um, it's it's a very difficult history of giant cell arthritis, or an easy way to call it. So this is the most common form of systemic arthritis. It's actually much more common in my country than in India, but it still does occur. We've been here since the 1970s, 80s, so we had a key patient presentation. Well, it was actually more common in women than men. The presentation was headache accompanied by systemic features, and importantly, blindness can occur due to involvement of the short ciliary arteries and occlusion. Now, clinical examination is often unremarkable. It's possible you may feel enlarged temporal arteries and tender temporal arteries. In my experience, that's maybe only 10 or 15% of patients. But it's often accompanied by what's called polynomial magica, which is a feeling of stiffness and pain that is over the hurdle and the gallery hurdle. So, on the pathophysiology, again, there's a genetic component. This time it's HLATRP1. And perhaps you'll notice that rheumatoid, in ASPA, in this condition, it's all HLA determinants that are uh, predisposing or associated with the disease. That's because antigen presentation is done in the context of HLA molecules, and with different HLA molecules, there seems to be a different propensity for the immune system to, to misrecognize cell proteins as foreign proteins. Now, the uh, fact that you see there's an inflammatory infiltrate of the blood vessels, medium sized vessels, usually, you get giant cells, here's one here, here's one here, here's one here. In the uh, vessel wall, hence the name giant cell arthritis. So there's activation of T cells, TH1 and 17 macrophages, and that narrows the uh, vessel wall and leads to vessel obstruction. So um, it's a clinical diagnosis primarily. So whenever you hear a history like that, you think, well, this could be giant cell arthritis. With the ways the plant came up, as that pretty much almost clenches it. And increasingly, we're using what's called temporal artery ultrasound to support diagnosis. And this is an image of a temporal artery ultrasound. It's a Doppler one. So, what the red area here is blood flow in the vessel, and the dark area here is the surrounding vessel wall. And that's what's called the halo sign. So the blood in the middle of the dark area, the halo sign. Very importantly, though, a negative ultrasound does not exclude the diagnosis. So, if the ultrasound is negative, look. Take yourself that it's not GCA, it certainly could uh, be. The, the clinching part of the diagnosis is a rapid response of symptoms to the high dose steroids. Okay, and that is the treatment. The first line of the treatment is high dose steroids. We give prednisone 40 to 60 weeks daily until the symptoms subside and the inflammatory markers fall and then taper. Now, there's been a new development in treatment recently. We're using more um, in the way of dangerous vessels to act as steroid saving agents. And I'm going to highlight one which is called tocilizumab, which many of you may be familiar with the treatment of severe COVID. It means a lot of the treatment of severe COVID. Um, we also use uh, a little bit of methotrexate for a piece of hurricane. Other things you may need to do is a prophylaxis against osteoporosis. The small snakes are most common drugs for that and address vascular risk factors. So, um, just this is the evidence base for tocilizumab. So, this was a randomized trial. The participants were randomized to two groups. The placebo has the blue lines or the orange lines. So, this group was randomized to placebo, either with a slow steroid reduction, that's blue, or with a fast steroid reduction. And the vertical axis is the number of patients who may have elapsed. So what you can notice in the placebo group, by one year, only about 40 percent, maybe 30 to 40 percent, were fewer of the labs. In other words, 60 to 70 percent had relapsed beyond steroids. With tocilizumab, there were two dose ranges in the tocilizumab, but they were all on fast reduction. And what you can see is the opposite. This time, only 20 percent had relapsed by on tocilizumab. So this is a pretty effective steroid sphere. So thinking that we brought this man, we started with the steroids, we came to this background. What what complication would you in the audience be concerned about in this patient when we start with steroids? Would anyone be concerned about the antecedent axis? Would anyone be concerned about worsening angina or doing practice angina? Anyone for that? No. 
And then we're worried about osteoporotic fractures as a complication. And there may be a problem. And then we're worried about is diabetes going out of control? No one. You're all very great. And then we're worried about weight gain or hypertension. Well, in fact, what you would be worried about is this diabetes going out of control. It's on that corner, right? His HB1C is just at the upper limit of the target. And when you hit him with prednisolone at 60 milligrams, he is going to, he's going to have problems with diabetes. Do you think I'd give this patient tosilizumab? Would I? Yeah? You yeah. bet I would. I'd definitely give him tosilizumab. I would also um, ask, uh, make sure he's monitoring his blood sugar very, very carefully. Self-testing, three or four times a day. If the sugar is going well, up, certainly if it's not well, you would be introducing glycoside, something like that you do need to get the sugar below 12, and eventually it may, uh, may also be needed. So, um, that was a patient with giant cell arthritis. So it's the most common form of vasculitis. Genetic factors are out there, both if you are environmentally you just don't know idea really what they are. But the clinical presentation is key. Headaches, centimeters, polymalgia, and blindness is a very few complication. And in fact, because of that, if you sum for GCA, it is a medical emergency. The next GCA, get them steroids straight away. Because if you become blind, it's irreversible. And uh, the fact that they really have to take more experience of the condition. And as I mentioned, Crossless now and CTRs are steroid sparing agents. So I'd like to end my lecture here. Sorry about slightly though, the internet wasn't fast enough. And I'd like to thank you for your attention. I hope you find I hope you find the presentation interesting and informative. Thank you once more.